Thanks for joining me on the Maine Science Podcast. I'm Kate Dickerson. This episode is a conversation that I have with Sharon Klein, who is an associate professor at the University of Maine. Sharon and I have known each other for a long time, and one of the best parts of this conversation for me was finding out new things about Sharon in her work that I had never heard before. The other really great part of this conversation is that Sharon explains really, really well what it is that professors do in general and their mission at the University of Maine in particular. I think the life of a professor can seem a little hidden to the rest of the world, and I really appreciated how Sharon talked about her work and how she incorporates students in her work. I hope you enjoy the conversation. I've included links to Sharon's website in the show notes. Well, I'm an associate professor in the School of Economics, but I am an interdisciplinary energy researcher, so I'm not a traditional economist. My background is engineering and public policy, and I study energy issues from technical, economic, environmental, and social perspectives. So I use kind of a mix of economic costing analysis of energy options and that uses a little bit of engineering. And I also do things like surveys and workshops with people to understand how they think and talk about and make decisions about energy. And I also have done some life cycle assessment, which is a way to estimate the environmental impact of different energy sources. What got you interested in, in kind of environmental aspect of energy and, and the engineering pieces? Well, that goes back a long way. Um, I first got interested in the environment when I was in middle school, and I got somehow a flyer from the Rainforest Action Network sent to my house, and I read it and learned about the ongoing destruction of the rainforests. And I was horrified, and I think I might have even cried. I'm not sure, but... And where did you grow up? I'm assuming you weren't right next to a rainforest. No, no, I grew up in Situate, Massachusetts, just south of Boston. So that kind of hooked me to start with that that was kind of, I think, the first time I realized that how in in trouble our environment was. And then there were just a lot of life experiences that reinforced that throughout high school. And then as I got into college and kind of tried to figure out what I wanted to do. So I ended up majoring in environmental science for my bachelor's degree. And I, I just kind of felt like every class I took, every book I read, every lecture I attended, all of the environmental issues that they were talking about somehow related to energy. And I don't think I really internalized that until many years later, but I kind of pondered it a little bit in college. And then I went off to do AmeriCorps, which was a variety of different experiences that kind of helped shape my thinking about the environment and people and service and things like that. And then I went and I was a teacher for five years and for three of the or for two of those years I taught environmental systems and so again I was kind of back into that course material that was reminding me that all of these problems somehow related to energy and so that was during the time when I lived in Ecuador and I was thinking about returning to school to get a a master's or a PhD and so that was a really good time to to finally sit down and contemplate this observation that had started when I was in um, college that that all of these environmental problems linked to energy. And so I started to look for master's and PhD programs that would help me explore that. And that's where I found Carnegie Mellon's engineering and public policy program because I just thought there are so many technical solutions to our energy problems, but most of the barriers to them are actually policy related. That's when everything kind of came together for me. And then somehow I ended up in, in economics to pull it all together. <laughs> I, I will say that when I like applied to graduate programs, I was all over the place. Like I didn't know, I, I knew I wanted to do something related to energy and or climate change, but I would apply to like environmental science programs, forestry programs, the engineering and public policy program and and kind of all over the map and so I was writing these essays and and intro letters to faculty about just so many different things and so the the thing that I actually wrote about to get into Carnegie Mellon was about some process to turn liquid fuel into gas and then burn it 
And so I kind of came in there on kind of a, a biofuels mission, <laughs> but it wasn't really what I wanted to study. I had always been interested in solar. And so when the director of the program at kind of a, a seminar early in my program just kind of offhand mentioned that they had money to study solar, I jumped at that opportunity. And that's kind of how I landed my research program in my, in my PhD program about solar energy. So first, I, I want to note, I think it's really interesting that you didn't know exactly what you wanted, even when you knew you wanted environmental uh, studies. And I'm, I'm curious how it was that Carnegie Mellon sold, like what was it about that program in particular that you did? I'm assuming you had more than one choice for graduate school. So why Carnegie Mellon? So I actually started my bachelor's program in engineering. I started at Cornell University um, as environmental engineering. But I hated the fact that engineering had my whole life planned out for me. <laughs> I just could not stand that at 18 years old. <laughs> I needed some more flexibility to find myself and that kind of thing. And there were a lot of other reasons, but I ended up you know, transferring to UMass Amherst and selecting environmental uh, sciences because it was a lot more flexible to kind of, I guess, find myself, figure out what I wanted to do with my life, right? Which, of course, I don't think I figured out until I was about 35, but still. It was, but during that process, I mean, the reason I chose engineering in the first place back when I was 18 was because I wanted to learn the hard stuff. And then I figured if I decided, because I was kind of already then and interested in policy and maybe law and maybe teaching, and I thought if I learned the hard stuff first, then I, I would, it would be easier for me to like translate that into policy or law or something like that. And I remember, this is just so bizarre, I remember taking at Cornell a physical education class that was called Expanding Intuition. <laughs> and we basically went to this like common area lounge, laid down and meditated. It was so bizarre. <laughs> The, the instructor for that, I remember talking with him um, afterwards, and he kind of asked me why I was studying engineering, and I told him what I just told you about, you know, wanting to learn the hard stuff and everything, and he's like, you know, that's, that's really great. You know, things are going to change, you know, as you get older, and you're going to find that you do different things, and you go down different paths, but hold on to that, because that's really important. That's a really good reason to do what you're doing. And then, of course, I went and changed everything, and I <laughs> went to UMass, did environmental science, did all these other things, but when I was looking at grad school, I think I really reflected on that and thought, I, I really am interested in that intersection of technology and policy and how we can get the two to kind of work together. And that's why Carnegie Mellon attracted me so much, because I didn't see anything else out there like that where I was looking. So one of the most interesting things I think is that you are, and it sounds like you always have been committed to solar energy. And I know you and I have talked about this in the past, an awful lot of people think that solar can't work unless you are on the equator, or at least much further south than most of, you know, that Maine is in Europe. So I would like to offer you the opportunity to kind of explain why, number one, you've always been so committed to solar, and number two, why it's a better energy source than people might realize. Sure. Well, on the first point, why I've always been committed to solar, I just like it. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of other reasons, but I, I have to say I love the sun, and I love the idea of just taking the power of the sun and running everything. I just love it. It just seems so simple and and great and pretty and everything. Um, I, I have to say, like, I've toured really large concentrated solar power plants and it's been wonderful for my research but I just think they're pretty too. <laughs> Can you explain really quickly what a concentrated solar power plant is? Sure a concentrated solar power plant is a solar power plant that takes the heat energy from the sun and converts it to electricity as opposed to photovoltaic modules which excite electrons in a, a, a solar cell, kind of like a battery, you know, like it, it moves electrons directly from the sun hitting the, the panel. And so the concentrated solar power is a more indirect technology because it takes the heat from the sun, concentrates the sunlight onto a tube filled with a fluid, heats up the fluid, and then transfers the heat from the fluid to um, a steam cycle 
that runs just like a coal power plant, except with, without the coal. Right. So the, what makes a concentrated solar facility so pretty? It's all the mirrors. They're, um, they're, and the, ones that, the one that I was studying for my PhD work is called parabolic trough. And they're these curved trough-like mirrors that are tilted toward the sun. And so, again, I just think they're cool. So now that we've established that solar energy is uh, pretty and cool. I do, I do feel like I should say something more scientific about solar. <laughs> no, I don't think so. I actually think it's pretty inspiring that, that something that you find it cool and interesting and wonderful that you've wanted to study this because of your experience like just being in the sun essentially right and, and seeing how people are using the sun like I think that that is a level or a type of inspiration that most people don't think any scientist would ever get which I I would like to dispel I think a lot of a lot of really interesting science happens because people get inspired by one little something fill in the blank you know and in your case the sun is pretty cool and I remember I mean living in San Diego there's a ton of sun and I just remember getting into my car at, after work every day and just feeling the heat and being like Seriously, why aren't we doing something with this, you know? So that is an excellent point and it leads me back around to, okay, San Diego makes sense. We should be doing solar. Why Maine? Well, so one of the great, and so again, coming back to, there are actually some good scientific reasons why I focus on solar as well in terms of solving those environmental problems, but just, so, so kind of, let me talk about that for a second and then I will answer your question um I'm not gonna let you go without answering that question so so I mean I haven't it's hard to find comparable numbers about all of the different environmental effects um, related to energy to compare across energy technologies to say definitively you know that this is the technology we should use because they all have advantages and disadvantages but in the in the last decade or so that I've been studying energy, I guess it's been about 13 years, I've started to just kind of see this pattern that the very big challenges that are associated with other renewable technologies just aren't present with solar, especially with solar photovoltaic, that one where it's the direct sunlight that excites the electrons. So the photovoltaic is what people probably see when they look at rooftops or, or like a, you know, a, a field next to the highway that has a bunch of those panels. Yes, right, exactly. So can you give me an example of what, what isn't there for solar that is there for others? Sure. So for example, I mean, when I was studying concentrated solar power, I just thought the technology was cool. And then, <laughs> you know, I like... And I came to this as a fighting climate change kind of thing and a fighting air pollution and, and all of, like the water pollution, everything that's associated with fossil fuels that's bad for the environment. And so a lot of renewable energy can do that. It can reduce fossil fuel use and thereby reduce climate change impacts and air pollution and water pollution. But as I researched concentrated solar power, I found out that there was a water issue a water use issue and a um, land transformation issue with it. So a lot of these power plants that are being built for concentrated solar power require vast stretches of um, sensitive desert ecosystem to be clear cut to make room for them. And then you're using a ton of water for the steam cycle in a desert area. And so for those reasons, there were actually local environmental groups that were stopping concentrated solar power plants from being implemented. Then you look at wind. There's a long history of people stopping wind turbines from being installed because of the deaths to birds and bats. And while those deaths are not, are probably, I haven't done the calculation, but probably not nearly as bad as what, you know, mountaintop removal of coal does to birds and bats, solar PV doesn't do any of that. There's nothing, there, there's no killing of birds and bats with concentrate with um, solar PV. With concentrated solar power, you can actually incinerate birds if you use the towers, but <laughs> with hydropower, you have the fish kills and the transformation of the river that's a big deal. Um, so yeah. Anyway. I'm going to interrupt you to play a little bit of devil's advocate. The life cycle analysis, which is something where you look at the whole process of whatever that life cycle is, how does the creation and the manufacture and the building of the, of the photovoltaic 
cells impact um, in comparison with climate change? Like, what kind of impact is there with that? So there's certainly an impact, and it's mostly from the fact that those are built using fossil fuels. So if we actually did transfer to a fully renewable economy, then that impact wouldn't be there as much because the manufacturer would also be from renewables. But when you look at the whole life cycle, that impact is so small compared to fossil fuels for all of the renewable energy options. So if you kind of look at a graph of life cycle greenhouse gas emissions from all of your different technologies, which I actually have in a paper, you'll see that the, that the, you know, there, there are varying impacts between the renewables, but all of the renewables are kind of clustered together as really low compared to fossil fuels. All right. And now I'm going to circle back and make you answer, why does solar for Maine make sense? Oh, yes. So um, in addition to what one kind of advantage to another advantage to solar PV that I hadn't mentioned is it doesn't have any moving parts. And so that's why it doesn't kill birds and bats and fish, right? So in addition to all of those great benefits compared to some other renewables, you can put it anywhere. And that again, like you said, people don't realize that. They think you can only put it in San Diego or you can only put it at the equator. But everywhere across the United States, we have enough solar radiation that you can install solar energy and get enough energy to power something. So then it just becomes a matter of degree. Is, is the metric that you're looking at a cost metric? And so sure, it's going to be more cost effective to install solar in San Diego than in Maine, but it still is cost effective to install solar in Maine. It's just not as. And, and actually, some of the cost effectiveness isn't down to the solar radiation, it's down to the state level policy. So it's actually more cost effective to install solar in Massachusetts than it is in Maine, because they have better state policies. And what kind of state policy do you mean? So, oh gosh, I'm going to have to... It's been a while since I studied uh, Massachusetts <laughs> solar policy. Just as an example, like what would make it more cost effective? Is it, is it tax rebates? Is it... Is it providing loans for it at a low rate? The main thing that Massachusetts has that Maine does not have is a solar carve out in their renewable portfolio standard. And so that gives an additional incentive for people to buy from solar producers as opposed to other renewable energy producers. And it, and it kind of compensates for the fact that solar can be more expensive to install in the beginning compared to some other renewable energy options. So there's a financial incentive through policy to push that over other renewable options. Right. Maybe not to push it over other renewable options, but to make sure that it's part of the game. So that it's, it's not just excluded because of the higher installation cost. Because one of the, again, one of the nice things about solar PV is that you're, you don't have a lot of maintenance to do on it. So if you compare it to something like hydropower where you have a lot of operation and maintenance that goes into the dam and and everything that's involved with it you just put up a solar panel and let it be you know and then maybe 15 years later you have to replace the inverter which is i can tell you about if you want but like it, it's something that helps the system work and then the panels last i think they have a warranty for about 25 years to last so I, was, I actually just did this calculation today for an article that I'm writing for the main policy review. If you look at like a residential solar photovoltaic system in Maine, your payback period, which is taking the amount that you pay for the panels and dividing it by how much you're going to save on your electric bill, is about nine years. And a couple of years ago, I did a study that looked at what that payback period was for Massachusetts. And it was about five years. And that was all due to policy, not really a change in um, solar radiation, because we have pretty similar solar radiation. Oh, that's really interesting. So that's the intersection of the technology and the policy that you've been interested in for a long time. Maybe we can bring this around. What is your research now, now that you have been able to dive into solar? Um, you're not doing, you know, you're not, I'm assuming you're not doing research on how to make even better solar panels. What kind of research do you do now I know you do more than just solar energy, so I'll let you fill in all the blanks. So since I started at UMaine, 
Uh, my research on solar energy has kind of been something I've done on the side without a lot of funding, but is probably my greatest passion. I've, I've also been passionate about the other projects I've worked on, but the solar research I've done hasn't, I haven't been able to have the kind of funding yet that I need to really focus a, a targeted grant program on it. So it's a little bit all over the place, <laughs> kind of like what I research when, I, when I'm able to find the time and, and the resources. So one thing that I'm working on, well, that I, that I very recently did, I submitted an article a couple months ago that's under review comparing different financing approaches for community solar farms and how those af approaches affect people who build the solar farms and people who subscribe to them. There's a lot of different ways that you can involve people in this and work out the finances. So this paper I did compared the overall kind of like cost effectiveness of different financing approaches for the people who buy into the array, the people who host them, who own the land that has the array on it, and the developer that's actually putting the array in. And those are all main based or did you look all over? Well, so this was some, something I would love to do on a more large scale, but it was kind of worked in with an honors project that I was advising this year where I had a, an honors undergraduate student working with A Climate to Thrive off of Mount Desert Island, and they, they were looking to put in a community solar farm. So one of the things that she was doing was a cost-benefit analysis of a community solar farm for them, and she used a model out of Chicago for this because that's really the only one that exists. So for the paper, I kind of built off of what she and I had worked on together for her honors thesis and um, did a comparison between, it was like, I think it was like 15 case studies for Chicago and then compared that to the Mount Desert Island case. When you were describing the community solar, it sounds a little bit like what people do with community supported agriculture with the difference being people don't pitch in and like go, have a free for all on the food but there is one person providing the food and people put money towards it to support it is it is that a similar analogy in some ways like yeah i think that that is a good one i think that might be one of the i i, I think the community supported agriculture movement in maine has is strong and vibrant and long it's been here for a long time and I, I wonder if that's one of the reasons why community solar has been one of these things where people have just said, well, we're just going to go do it. I definitely think, you know, there's a main can-do, do-it-yourself attitude, and people are not afraid to just dig in and make it happen. And I've seen that in my other work, well, and in a lot of my other work, but uh, I've, I've wanted for a long time to make a stronger research connection between these two things, but... I think there's a, a similar element with community built window inserts, and that's an energy efficiency product that I study also. And those are inserts that go inside your window to prevent heat, heat loss from escaping during the winter. They're just wooden frames wrapped in two layers of plastic and lined with weather stripping. And Maine leads the nation in, <laughs> in this, this, this socio-technical innovation where it's, it's something that was invented by Mainers and the, the whole process of getting people together and kind of having this barn raising event to have every, everybody in the community build these together is an innovation that's specific to Maine. And it's growing across the state and actually spreading now into several neighboring states and even as far as Minnesota, they, they've been getting requests for you know learning how to lead these different workshops to build these inserts and I can tell you more about that if you want as well. I would like you to tell us about that and any part of your research that you haven't had a chance to talk about. So since 2015 again as another research project where I've just kind of had very limited to no funding to be able to do this I just kind of go by the seat of my pants and do what I feel passionate about. I've been working with an organization called Window Dressers that started here in Rockland, Maine back in 2010, I believe. And what they do is they train local volunteers to organize and run 
these community window insert building workshops. So they have a local coordinator, which is a volunteer from a given community who goes out and asks people if they want these inserts built for their homes. And then they have a team of, that, that local coordinator has a team of volunteers who go into people's homes and measure the windows. And then they send those measurements back to the window dressers headquarters in Rockland. Rockland cuts the wood for them, prepares all the materials, buys all the materials, and then s ships them out to the, well actually the people go pick them up. The local coordinator goes to Rockland and picks up all the materials. And then the local coordinator runs like a week long workshop with volunteers in the community and with the people who ordered the inserts. So when you order the inserts, you pay the cost of materials, then you also volunteer your time to help build a certain amount of inserts for yourself and for your, the, the other people in your community that are ordering them. And so I just really got attracted to this because I was looking for something that my students could get involved with that would teach them about sustainable energy, but in a hands-on way. So I loved the fact that this was a technical innovation that was easy to do, it was cost effective, it saves people a lot of money, and I've done research to kind of confirm that. And it's low cost to kind of implement, so with the cost of materials, you're looking at like $30 an insert compared to like you know $300 if you had to get a new window. So it's saving people money in that regard as well. And these inserts you can use year to year. I can speak from experience. The hardest thing about them is to keep them away from cats. Yes. <laughs> we, I actually had a student working on some research about that. But also the, the social sustainability about it is so cool too because it's really um, adding to the you know, community resiliency. It's bringing people together. It's adding this kind of value to the community. And, and then energy literacy. You get people talking about renewable energy and other you know, sustainable energy issues when you're at these window insert workshops. And then obviously the environmental savings too, because here in Maine, we mostly use um, fuel oil for heating and it's the dirtiest thing that we can possibly use for heating. So anything we can do to reduce that is, is huge for the environment. So do your students recognize this as a technical fix or does it seem so low tech to them that it, they wouldn't even put it in that category? What do they get out of it? It depends on the year and the way that the project is integrated with my classes. And, and so one of the reasons I was attracted to this is because as a professor at, at a land-grant institution like UMaine, I have a triple focus on teaching, research, and service. And I saw this as a project that I could really integrate all three. And so for, for the last five years, I've really been trying to figure out the best way to integrate this project into my classes in a way that students get a lot of value from the work and also it supports my research and informs their education by my research and it enhances their own education and they give back something they also give back some service to the community and learn about the community and so anything you know labor intensive time intensive <laughs> complex and um, experimental like this has to go through a few iterations. And so I would say with the first iteration of it, I actually did it as a pilot course where the students, there were 10 students, they and I together completely ran the uh, window insert building workshop, a week long workshop in Bangor together. And I think for them, they really got that this was a technical innovation because they also had to design research questions about it. And that's like the the student I told you who was working on his thing was he wanted inserts for his house, but he had pets and he wanted to be able to make them durable against pets. And, and window dressers was really interested in that as well. And so he experimented with some different materials to see if, if any of them were stronger against, you know, cat scratches <laughs> and something else. He, he found some promising materials, but they haven't yet been, I think, fleshed out enough that they could be adopted by window dressers. That sounds like the perfect research. It just You just need to know more information. You're not going to get it on the first try. Right, exactly. So yeah, I think that, that year they really got it. Then there's been, you know, different variations. And I think the, what I've noticed is that the more that they're involved with actually 
designing the build and running the build, they kind of get it. Because one of the cool things about this, I mean, in terms of technical innovation, even though the inserts themselves are just kind of these frames wrapped in plastic and it is very simple, the jigs, <laughs> the jigs are like a whole other main innovation. So for every step of the process, you need to have something that volunteers can use quickly and that they can learn how to use easily. Because what you have is you have like four hour shifts where people come in who've never done this before. Some of them have never held a drill or anything like that before. And you have to have that, you have to be able to teach them early enough in the four hour shift so that they can work for close to four hours on this and get it done. And so we have this person in Rockland who, who has designed and built all of these jigs to make it easier. They're these wooden things, like one of them is a white taping jig and you put the insert in and you turn it fast and it's just so much easier than trying to apply white tape with your hands. <laughs> it, it, you know, it cuts the production time for the white taping step by like, I don't know, 90% or something. So there's, there's all these jigs that are just, you know, crazy technical innovations. And actually one of my, the student who did the, the cat scratch experiment also helped to design a shield around the heat gun that's used in the heat gun jig. So before, like when I first started this, volunteers were using hair dryers to heat shrink the, the plastic. And that's what people t tend to use in their windows you know if they get the plastic that goes up every year they use the hair dryer well around the time that we were doing this they realized they really needed a heat gun and so they built a jig that could hold a heat gun and you could pass the insert underneath but the the heat was kind of going everywhere and so my student along with this person from window dressers that was helping us they invented this you know plastic shield that went around the heat gun and and targeted the heat down to the insert so it would be more efficient Everything. So all of the, that kind of innovation is just happening in front of your eyes, and it's so cool. Again, with, with, with the cool, I get excited about it. I get really excited about it. I don't even know how to top that. Can I just add one other thing about the window insert? Yes, I was gonna, I was gonna ask if you had anything else you wanted to add. Just because I, I mostly talked about the service learning aspect of that project, but there's actually been some really neat research that we've done, uh, me along with uh, some students over the course of the last five years and that's been focused on actually quantifying the energy savings, emission savings, and other benefits of and, and then the cost savings of these inserts for people and for the environment. And so we've got a, I, I now have a pretty good model, you know, like where we can plug in numbers and see what each insert should save a household depending on whether they have like single or double pane windows or natural gas or fuel oil heating and things like that. But what I want to do is, is get grant funding so that we can do more kind of retroactive looks at energy savings. So if we got people's heating bills over time, can we look back and see that there was a change when they put in their inserts versus before they put in their inserts? And we need a lot of data to be able to do that. We need a lot of people who are willing to share their, their energy bills. And the process, we, we kind of tried to do this a little bit in 2016 with a master's student project, but it became really complicated fast because fuel oil is a very difficult oil um, heating fuel to, to track that way for a lot of different reasons. And then also you can do blow, blower door tests on homes to see how much um, air is escaping through the different crevices of the house. And so what I wanna do is get a bunch, you know, we've, we've done seven blower door tests to see before you put in the inserts, after you put in the inserts, how much air is being lost through the house and how are the inserts affecting that. But that's not enough to be a statistically significant sample. So I'm, I'm looking to, to kind of expand that and do more tests. And I've been partnering with Penobscot Home Performance um, to help with that. And my graduate student who did the work that helped with the model, and he was part of that original 2015 class and everything. He now works at Efficiency Maine, so he's interested in this work too to try to get Efficiency Maine more involved in this kind of window insert thing as well. I think one of the best things about talking to 
about this is, well, obviously how excited you get, but also the, the real applications and hearing how you step your students through it so that the, the numbers, you, know, you can quantify numbers for both emissions and savings. I think one of the hardest things for climate change is people think that their little bit isn't enough and, and that might be true, but when you add them all together, it's a lot. So by being able to do this, I think you, 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 you're building that story further. Yeah, I, I appreciate you saying that because that's been an upward struggle, I have to say. Through this process, I've heard, you know, just that kind of thing. Like, well, you, you can't put solar panels on everybody's roofs. That's not going to solve the problem. You can't, you know, inserts aren't going to solve the problem. And people want want to be able to do something about this they want to be able to do something tangible and every little bit does help it's not there are bigger things that have to happen our federal government needs to make a commitment to climate change to stopping it and there needs to be targeted policy from above but while that's not happening we need people to do what they can and it does make a difference i can't think of a better way to end thanks so much for letting me steal just a little bit of your time to talk about your work. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. The Maine Science Podcast has received support from the Maine Technology Institute and is recorded at Discovery Studios in Bangor, Maine at the Maine Discovery Museum. The Maine Science Podcast is produced and edited by me, Kate Dickerson. I received production support from Miranda Bouchard, and the Discover Main theme was composed and performed by Nick Parker.